Well, good afternoon, friends. You are keen, aren't you? You're the faithful remnant in here. Well, we've got a chance now to look at some of the needs and the opportunities for the church in Europe. Europe was once known as Christendom. It is now known by missiologists as the spiritually darkest continent on earth. Now, people from other continents often struggle to believe that, particularly because of our history. And you look at the English countryside where I come from, and it can be hard to believe it because there are so many fossils of Christianity all around. In every town, in every village, you'll see church spires, churches that are a thousand years old, but they are fossils for the most part. If you want to understand where spiritually Europe is at today, I think you need to think of Jesus' interaction with Pilate in John 18. Do you remember Pilate is interviewing Jesus, and Jesus says, I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And after he'd said this, he went back outside to the Jews. He's not really wanting to know what is truth. It's a cynical question. And nearly 2,000 years later, that is what characterizes Europe today. Like Pilate, European culture now is skeptical, deeply averse to truth, and syncretistically pagan. And when confronted with the very concept of truth, Europeans today feel a glow of sophisticated superiority. They ask, what is truth? And like Pilate, they walk out not expecting to hear an answer. Truth is seen as an exploded old dream of yesterday to be sneered at and ignored. Now, some of what I'm saying is going to sound familiar to you in the US, right? And there is certainly similarity, only the situation is much more far gone in Europe. And this matters for the US, as I want to come on to show. For example, the percentage of churchgoers in the US regularly outstrips that of most European cultures 20 times over. So take churches around the US and take 19 out of every 20 believers out. That's what the church scene looks like. And so what you think of as a big church, strip it down to 1 20th of the size, that's what a European culture thinks is a big church. It is normative for European Christians to expect open ridicule, or worse, on any declaration of faith. And you see some of the other difference in European and American politics. So in the US, it's still quite normal for politicians to make references to God. And that can still be uh, a positive thing for your electoral hopes. Not so in Europe. This is now over 20 years since British Prime Minister Tony Blair's press secretary said, we don't do God. And things have moved on since his day. If you want to see some of the details of UK beliefs, you can look at Ligonier's The State of Theology 
Com slash UK to see the findings of uh, where beliefs are at, and it's quite horrifying. Now, the fact that Europe has returned to Pontius Pilate's skepticism for an absolute disregard for absolute and authoritative truth means in Europe we are back with his old classic pagan problems. In paganism, there is no upright, fatherly providence steering creation, no loving acceptance by God, no sure hope. In paganism, you are unloved, unprotected, and hopeless. And just so again today in Europe, with a sovereign God and sovereign truth removed, a culture that is looking for self-autonomy, people are now finding themselves adrift on this endless sea of meaninglessness and moral confusion. Society has lost the truth that could give it coherence, and we are seeing the whirlwind now. No longer living in a divinely ordered cosmos, people feel themselves in a chaotic, terrifying universe at the non-existent mercy of impersonal and pitiless forces of nature. I'm talking about Europe, but here's where some of the home relevance kicks in. Europe is the seedbed of atheism, but Europe has become the epicenter of the disease that has now spread its spores all over the world. And in Europe, having weakened society's moorings to its Christian heritage, we see the transgender movement far more aggressive in Europe than it is here so far. Because Loss of the fear of God leads to moral confusion and a confusion about what it is to be human. And all that means the door has been left wide open to militant Islam. And that has been a very interesting challenge for the church. And I've known this um, pastoring in central London where we would meet many Muslims and talk with them. And I found, and I've seen across the UK, the challenge of Islam has forced the church to do better theology, to answer the theological and apologetic challenges of Islam. And that helps you start seeing some of the opportunity that's here. Oh, it's a dark background, but some of the opportunity. For the answer to all this is found in robust theology, fueling robust expository preaching, building and growing healthy churches. That is the answer for Europe. You know, Dorothy Sayers once wrote, we're constantly assured that the churches are empty because preachers insist too much upon doctrine, dull dogma, as people call it. The fact is the precise opposite. It is the neglect of dogma that makes for dullness. The Christian faith is the most exciting drama that has ever staggered the imagination of man, and the dogma is the drama. And we have been given a model for how to respond by a man who saw that it is robust theology that can turn back the tide. His name was John Calvin. And John Calvin, 500 years ago, nearly, in Geneva, established an academy where he would raise up pastors, godly, wise, scripture-soaked, theologically knowledgeable pastors, 
who would love God, love his people, and he raised them up in the academy in Geneva, and he provided them with books. And in Geneva, printing, publishing became the dominant industry of the city. Can you imagine that of any city? Printing's the dominant industry. And then, in the mid-1550s, Calvin set up a program for the re-evangelization of Europe. And what he did, particularly focusing on his own native France, he set up hiding places, networks to slip agents of the gospel over the border into France there, equipped with books that were often deliberately made pocket size so that they wouldn't be found. They could smuggle them in. So you look at a first edition of the institutes, it's that sort of size, so it can be just put in a pocket. And these men would slip across, there were secret printing presses placed in Paris and Lyon, and they would move in and they would plant sometimes literally underground churches. Some of these churches grew to 9,000 strong. In about seven years, from 1555 to 1562, Calvin and his partners in France saw to the planting of over 2,150 churches. And the effect on France was extraordinary. It's very hard to know the exact numbers, but it seems like something like a third of the elite were converted and something like 10% of the population, a couple, two to three million were converted. Raising up leaders to plant out churches. Calvin saw it. He saw good theology drives good mission and can drive back the tide of bad theology. In fact, he said, a good theologian is a good missionary. A good missionary is a good theologian. And he would send men out to France, Hungary, Italy, Scotland, and even as far as Rio de Janeiro. That is our vision for today, to do it again. I want to tell you a little bit about Union. Thank you. Thank you. I want to tell you about my ministry, Union, which is working with Ligonier for the reformation of Christ's church. With Union, following Calvin's vision, we have set up 25 locations around the continent. And in each of these, they are church multiplication hubs where, like little Geneva academies, we are raising up leaders locally. And in each place, we raise up leaders. They're locally, these men are recruited by their churches. They're raised up. We can give them a degree, a, a degree, a master's, a PhD, where they are. And then they're sent out to plant churches, and we provide them, as Calvin did, with books. We have a publishing arm to fuel reformation in churches and in lives. And when we send these men out, we want to send out men with the right theology, orthodox men who delight in God, grow in Christ, servants of the church who bless the world. And we want to support them as they go out to enable them then to plant churches, having been raised up to then have, have the resources to plant churches. So we provide them with books and we also provide them with financial support where we can. And here is a testimony to the Lord's grace. In the last year, Due to the generosity of our supporters, we've been able to distribute about $650,000 to church planting projects across Europe.
is in the Lord kind. And these funds have resourced 46 church planting projects in Macedonia, London, Rome, elsewhere, and we are delighted to see these projects flourishing. We are thrilled to be working closely with Ligonier in this. And of course, because we're so closely aligned. But there is something that is very special about transatlantic gospel partnership. Both the US and Europe have always flourished best when we've worked together. So for instance, we have a program where we bring American students over to do a master's with us while working in one of these church plants. And they can study and we have two dreams for them. One is we expect most of them will come home to the US. The other is some of them may come and stay and work in Europe. If they come and stay and help us longer term in Europe, we're thrilled because we need more boots on the ground. And if they come home to the US, we are thrilled because they can bring back with them experience of what it's like to do mission and ministry in a post-Christian context. And so, here's the dream, working together, those students are just part of what this vision is for, working together we can help stop the disease spreading. In the Lord's grace, let's stop it at the source for both the sake of Europe and the US. And so I'd like to ask you, would you pray for us? Pray for union. You can see the logo here, perhaps, if you can see it on the screen. Pray for union. You can find out more on our stall. If you go out that exit there, head out, you'll see the union stall. Go and ask them now about what we're up to, how we're seeking the reformation of the church. Go and find out more. We would value your prayers. The Lord's been so kind to us. But friends, there is nothing inevitable about Western culture's de-Christianization. The same word of God has the same strength and power it always has. And creeping paganism has been checked and turned back before. It was in Augustine's day. It was in Luther's day. It was in Whitfield's day. And each time it has been men raised up heralding Christ alone. And did you hear that word alone? Not just heralding any old Christ, but heralding Christ as the complete and absolutely sufficient Savior. Holding out the gospel, meaning that we must recognize our helplessness and absolute need for Christ, his glorious sufficiency, and his exclusivity. And those truths have always been at the heart of paganism's defeat. Now, Pilate might have turned away after asking that question. Many will. But soon after John 18, after he turned away, Christ was lifted up from the earth as Savior on his blood-soaked throne. And he began to draw all people to himself. And that is what happens when Christ alone is lifted up as the way, the truth, and the life and all his glories are clearly displayed. Friends, please pray for Europe. 
pray that we might stand together for the cause of Christ across the Atlantic. Pray that the disease doesn't spread, that we can check it. Pray that the United States does not reach the level of post-Christian depravity that we now see in Europe. And pray, please pray for union and for Ligonier as we work together to herald Christ in the darkest continent on earth. Thank you.